Good afternoon. Welcome to this American Enterprise Institute webinar, Hybrid Homeschooling, the Future of Education. My name is Nat Malkus. I am the Deputy Director of Education Policy Studies and a resident scholar here at AEI. And I'm just thrilled today to be able to host this event, um, which is gonna be a conversation with Mike McShane, uh, a former AEI fame, and uh, as well, uh, Kathleena, Kathleena Edward Mons, Allison Morgan, and Antonio Perez on hybrid homeschooling. Um, we have a great show for you today. Uh, Mike McShane is the Director of National Research at EdChoice. And Mike writes extensively about school choice, educational entrepreneurship, innovation, and education policy uh, in a number of outlets, including the Huffington Post, National Affairs, USA Today. Uh, the list is too long to count. And occasionally you'll see him on our publications here at, at AEI. Kathleena Edward Mons is a professor of management information systems at Albany State University. And she's the founding director of the Center for Educational Opportunity, which provides support for K-12 research on educational innovations, opportunities, access, and models relevant to students who live in fragile communities. A, a homeschooler herself, Kathleena also does research specific to homeschooling. Allison Morgan is the founder and head of school at the Classical Christian Conservatory of Alexandria. CCCA is a hybrid model education program where students meet for classroom instruction and tutoring three days a week, and they complete assignments at home the other two days. And last but certainly not least, Antonio Paris is the founder of Walnut Hill Workshop which is a management consulting firm in Colorado that works with public and private education organizations to create new opportunities for students to receive instruction outside traditional schooling models. His clients and partners have included uh, Teach for America, Denver Families for Public Schools, uh, Reschool Colorado, and the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, we have a simple event today, it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna start off with Mike McShane, who's gonna, um, paint us a picture about hybrid homeschooling that comes from his new book, Hybrid Homeschooling, A Guide to the Future of Education, um, which is where we got the uh, title for today's event. Sorry for stealing that, Mike. Um, and Mike will sketch out just what hybrid homeschooling looks like and um, what the landscape looks like across uh, this great country. And then I'll invite Kathleen, Allison, and Antonio to uh, weigh in with their expertise and experience. Um, we'll then move at the end to an open discussion and um, give you some time at the very end for some question and answer uh, time. If you're on Twitter, the best way to give us questions uh, is to use our event hashtag, which is hashtag hybrid homeschooling, hybrid homeschooling. Um, and uh, you can use that hashtag to submit your questions and we'll be able to pick them up easily or if you prefer email, you can send them to tracy.shira at aei.org. And that email should be linked in the event page and on your RSVP email. Um, this event is being live streamed and full video of the event will be posted right after we conclude. So enough of me, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mike McShane who can talk to us about hybrid homeschooling. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you, Nat, and thanks to my fellow panelists. I'm so excited to hear what they have to say about the topic with a, their great experience and the various ways they've intersected with it. And thanks to everybody uh, at AEI. I know some of you that are watching this can't necessarily see all the work that goes on behind the scenes, but I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, my book, my new book, uh, Hybrid Homeschooling, A Guide to the Future of Education, which you know, ABC always be closing. I think it's available at your local neighborhood online book retailer. Um, was a really wonderful project that I've been working on for the past couple of years. You know, it's funny if we'd been having this event, you know, a year ago or maybe a year and a couple weeks ago, um, my task to explain hybrid homeschooling might have been more challenging. But as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and social distancing guidelines, um, a lot more people have been, uh, their eyes have been open to this idea of school going part-time. Students attending class uh, for part of the day in a formal school environment or being schooled at home for part of the week. But, uh, you know, I started writing this book before the pandemic happened. Uh, in fact, it was a couple of years ago, um, I host a podcast called Cool Schools, where I interview the, the leaders of cool and interesting schools. 
and I happen to via some grapevine that I actually don't fully even remember at this point, um, interview a woman by the name of Carrie Beckman, who runs the Regina Chaley Schools. I think she's still based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I'd never really heard of hybrid homeschooling before, and I had her on the podcast, and we spoke about her model, where, again, children are, are schooled at home for part of the week and are in school for part of the week. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. And uh, I think, as you mentioned, I write a column for Forbes. So I wrote my kind of monthly Forbes column uh, on that topic. And, you know, um, I'm happy if maybe a couple thousand people view a Forbes column that I write. Like, that's a big day for me. Um, and so I posted the column and, you know, sort of what I thought was interesting about it. And before I knew it, the clicks and the, the, the hundred north of 100,000 people viewed it and the emails started coming in. And I was fascinated that for months after I wrote that piece, um, folks were emailing me. And I was shocked at just the depth and breadth of people. They were all across the country. It was urban. It was rural. It was black. It was white. It was religious. It was non-religious. It was a little bit of everybody. And so I was like, man, I think I'm kind of onto something here. Um, and so I started working on this project and basically spent all of last school year interviewing, speaking with folks that are involved in this. Now, obviously, the coronavirus pandemic made it uh, that task a bit more difficult. So a lot of this was conducted like we are today over Zoom focus groups and others. And I have to, I can never thank enough, actually Allison and uh, several other school leaders who very kindly connected me to their teachers and, and families that participate in this. So I spent time speaking to lots and lots of people. Uh, I was able to speak with people across educational sectors. So traditional public school districts that are doing hybrid homeschooling, public charter schools that are doing hybrid homeschooling, private school models that are doing hybrid homeschooling, um, and really get an understanding both from the family perspective and from the educator perspective, both why folks are getting involved in this and what they're getting out of it. Um, and I have to be honest, I was really heartened by what I found. I think there can be so much in education today that is disheartening. There's so much that's divisive and so much that's contentious. But what I continued to find in these school environments, and like I said, spread across the country, um, urban, rural, um, private, charter, public, whatever way you want to look at it, were these really fascinating communities of families coming together, trying to solve these shared problems that they have, trying to figure out how best to educate their kids um, and to have a schooling model that kind of fits with their family life. So just like a couple things, and I, we'll, we can probably spend more talking, uh, time talking about this later again with folks that are directly involved in these sort of things. But some of the big takeaways that, that I took from my conversations with folks that were involved in this was this phrase that I kept hearing over and over again was the gift of time. What I kept hearing was parents telling me, uh, there's a great story, and this is one of the problems that I don't actually remember if I put this in the book or not. I should go back and see if I did. If not, you're getting some bonus content here today. But I was speaking to the leader of a hybrid homeschool uh, who was telling me, you know, oftentimes you'll see at back to school time, you'll see these memes circulate on social media of like the kids lined up in the foreground with their backpacks on and maybe they have school uniforms. On, and the parent and they're they have their tears they're very sad and you see parents in the background popping champagne bottles or high-fiving one another and what the school leader told me was you know our families don't really share that one that, that, that's not really the vibe that we have of our of our parent community here these are families that want to find time uh, find more time with their children and they want to find a schooling option that fits the rhythms of their family life obviously Parents were also looking at things like individual attention. Um, they were looking after their children's mental health. I spoke with lots of families of students with special needs that a traditional five day a week school environment was frankly kind of oppressive for them. That because of their particular learning needs, having a day off every other day or a couple days a week where they could kind of rest, recuperate, be in a safer environment was really important to them thriving in their educational model. And one of the last things I heard both from, from educators and from families was this other kind of sentence that keeps, or this phrase that keeps sticking in my mind ever since, is this idea of doing life together. Mm -hmm. These are people with shared values, with a shared vision, with a shared philosophy about raising children who've come together. And so the school is just one part of this broader community that they have built. They support each other. And what was fascinating to see was what happened to these communities when the coronavirus hit. 
And it turned out in so many of the conversations that I had, these were communities that were brought together by that tragedy, by, by, by all of those difficult forces sort of buffeting them from the outside. They were supporting each other. They were helping each other's children. They were looking out for one another in a way that I thought was really impressive and something that has a lot for us to teach or a lot to teach us. Now, sort of, uh, Nat, as you mentioned, in the name of this event and the subtitle to my book is A Guide to the Future of Education. Now, when that initially went to the publisher, that was kind of a cheeky uh, uh, subtitle. I didn't exactly realize when this started that the future was going to show up like right now. Um, I thought it was a little bit further down the road because really what I meant by that title at the time was not that I think that in the future, all of the all children in America are going to be in some sort of hybrid homeschooling model. What I thought was that the questions that hybrid homeschooling asks are questions that every school is going to have to wrestle with. So, for example, how does a school use time? You know, schools, regardless of their schedule, have a limited amount of time with children every week, every month, every year. How can they best use that time? We want to talk about relationships between families and schools. Obviously, so many of these schools I found saw these really, really strong, wonderful communication, high levels of trust that I think lots of educators across the country feel like we don't have in traditional schools. So what can we learn from these schools about fostering communication, fostering trust? And then finally, building community. I think successful schools have to be strong communities. And again, many of these schools are really purposeful about that community building work. Um, and so what can schools learn from that about trying to build great communities? Now, I will say one thing though, is that while I thought that was my vision for the future of education, as we, Lord willing, are coming to the tail end of the pandemic here and we're starting to see what life and what school might look like after all of that, um, there are some preliminary data points that again are just emerging now, so I wasn't able to put them in, in the book, about just how prevalent hybrid homeschooling or alternative educational models could be post pandemic. So we at EdChoice have our monthly public opinion tracker. We poll a nationally representative sample of Americans every month. Um, and obviously in that we get a lot of school pants. And starting at the beginning of this year, we have asked a question, would you, uh, when, what sort of schooling model would you prefer post pandemic? And we said, would you like a model that is solely at home, solely at school or somewhere in between? And we, we gave them different days for that. Now, the solely at home bit tends to match with our polling that we've done for years about how popular homeschooling is. Right now, I think it's about 10 to 15% of our sample say we would prefer to homeschool. And again, that's in line with polling that we've done for a long time. So when we ask that, would you like to go to school part-time question? I wanna be honest, when I drafted that or helped draft that question, I thought I would have been blown away if like 15% or 20% of, of families would say that they would want something part-time. We have been seeing north of 40%, north of 40% of parents have said that they would like to see some sort of part-time schooling going forward. Now, again, these are just, um, opinions. They're not, you know, people haven't done it yet. So there are obviously some hurdles that they would have to get over to actually do that. But I think that this kind of model where parents blend home and school more, where we see children on a much more flexible schedule and one that's in tune to the rhythms of family life could play a bigger role in our education system going forward. And I feel like I could do this for the next four or five hours. I'm very interested to hear uh, my fellow panelists, again, who have a great deal of experience in, in these fields. And again, Nat, thank you so much for putting this together. I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone. I think you're muted, Nat. There I am. Thanks, Mike. There you go. Um, so Mike, let me ask you one brief question uh, just before I turn to the panelists. Um, and it sort of comes off the heels of some of that polling question. We have a pretty clear idea of what homeschooling is when we think about sort of traditional homeschooling, right? All your schooling is from home. And um, the hybrid homeschooling sort of needs a definition, right? It's, it's sort of out there, it's a little soft around the edges. So when you talk about hybrid homeschooling in your book and use a functional definition, um, how would you describe that just in short terms? 
Yeah, so the, the simple way of looking at it is um, I'll sort of two ways of answering that question. Traditionally, when we talk about homeschooling from the kind of research literature on homeschooling, there's three domains, right? Funding, control, and location. So we say that a homeschooled student is one who's educated, is funded by their parent, it is located in their home, and it is controlled by their parents. And then again, you might imagine a public school student is this kind of opposite end of that, right? It's not funded by their parents, it's not controlled by their parents, it's not located in their home. So a hybrid student is one that's in between there. So it's partially located in their home, partially controlled by their parents, and in way, some ways partially funded, though it, it depends on the model that has there. For me, because we have homeschool co-ops and now we have micro schools, we have all of these different things. As soon as I draw a definition, someone will say, well, what about this? And it's like, oh, it's right. So the edges are kind of fuzzy, but I use a kind of three prong test here. The terms I use are physical, substantial, and regular. So what I mean by that is to be in my estimation of hybrid homeschooling, a student has to go to a physical location that is outside of their house at regular intervals for a substantial amount of time. And I count substantial as one school day per week, right? So again, models vary. Some are like four half days and some are two, three, and some are four, one, one, four. All of that kind of fits into this. And then again, there's on some of these edges, there are some homeschool co-ops that are very formalized. So like they're right, you know, they're right peering over the edge of hybrid homeschooling. They may be, they may not be, but that those are what I tried as best as possible to, to put uh, into the definition, knowing that there's some fuzziness on the edges. Fantastic. Well, thanks for that uh, overview, Mike. So now I want to turn to our, our panelists. And uh, Kathleen, I want to start with you. Um, you've done research on homeschooling, um, and you've also had experience as a homeschool mom for uh, you know more than 20 years. So when you look at hybrid homeschooling, uh, you know, just from a big picture standpoint, what would you say are the greatest challenges and opportunities that get presented with hybrid homeschooling? Great question. Uh, and thank you for having me in today's discussion. I appreciate the conversation and being a part of it. So I think that, uh, again, for 20 years, I've homeschooled our children. I think, again, to the work, to the notes that uh, were just shared, that there's still some fuzziness because I think the, the, the thing that's missing from the conversation is, and while um, there has been, and, and Mike talked about uh, various families, different varying dynamics, I think the families from fragile communities could really benefit the most, if you will, from this hybrid homeschool space. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen really in the literature, and I know that the concept of hybrid homeschooling appears to be new in the conversations and the research, I would venture to say, if you look at some of the historical work, particularly in communities of color, that hybrid homeschooling has really surfaced and its way in, in what we call freedom schools, what we call pit schools. There's a whole host of uh, settings, uh, Sunday schools, Sabbath schools, a whole host of settings in uh, black and brown communities where there's always been the sense of shared governance and educating kids. Um, and to your point, you, you said, well, you know, it depends on funding, control, and location. You know, as a homeschool mom, while we were ab obviously in control of the kind of uh, subject content that was shared with our children, we understood the value of community. And so in our space, we were probably a hybrid homeschool and didn't know it at the time because it wasn't called that. But when we call on uh, persons in our community, retired uh, educators who are certified teachers, who were actually helping us to deploy education for our family, that in and of itself would also see, seem to kind of have the trappings of home, hybrid homeschooling. If I were to say um, one thing that I hope our conversation tees around, it's not just about education, but it's also a question about ed equity as well as economics. And I hope that we're gonna have some chances to chat about that, but I think that there's some great opportunities to do research across a broader spectrum of population for a whole host of reasons of why people, particularly from color, communities of color can benefit, but primarily having this notion of being able to be a, part, a partner in education, because I think that's a misnomer in the research that some black and brown families think, see education as someone else's responsibility, but I beg to differ that there's quite a bit of research to state that we um, think that it's, a, it's our role as well. Mm. That's that. That's great, Kathleen. Thanks for that. And we'll we'll get. I have more questions to follow up on, but I'm going to have to just bite my tongue for now and get and get back to you. 
Um, Allison, I want to turn to you. You run a, ho a hybrid homeschool, um, like squarely in the hybrid homeschool model. So um, if you could just share a little bit about your experience, how did you get into this in the first place? What's it, what was it like before the pandemic? And maybe it changed a little bit. Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I would be happy to. Thank you for having me. And before I say anything, um, Mike, I want to take credit for your Forbes article going viral. I saw that thing in 2018, I think, and we posted it on our website and our marketing material and our training um, for, yeah. So I thought that was excellent. It was encouraging to read it when it came out in real time. So um, let's see, what was it like? I did not come to DC to start a school. Um, it was the furthest thing from my intentions when I moved here. Um, and it wasn't until I had children that I realized the dire straits that I was in in figuring out what was gonna work for our family. Um, yeah, we started, um, what was the question? COVID, how did it, how did it get impacts? Yeah, how did you get into it? And, you know, and, and what was sort of the run of the mill before COVID and then how have things changed since, uh, you know, everything's changed, but specifically in the yeah. hybrid homeschooling context? Yeah, well, I got into it kind of by accident, ironically and kind of humorously. I thought that I created hybrid homeschooling. I did not know of any hybrid homeschools. I there are none really in the area. Um, I just decided to pull some families together um, and hire a teacher, and we were off to the races. Um, in retrospect, I probably would do a few things differently, but um, in God's kindness, here we are, and um, in our fourth year, and it's going strong. Um, we need more space and we need more teachers and more money and all of the things. But um, before COVID, I have to say we were we were well situated for COVID. Um, we we had um, shared responsibilities between our educators and our parents. Um, our our students come to school on three days a week and then they're at home with their parents two days a week. Um, COVID hit with a school shut down. I, I think I spoke to you, Mike, in February of 2020, and you were scheduled to come tour and meet all of us and sit in and observe in April, but it was on March 13th that the governor shut us down, and so we're finally meeting face-to-face -face over Zoom. Um, I have to say we, we cranked that weekend when we were shut down and we were back up and running by Tuesday. Um, we transitioned immediately. I think being small and nimble worked for us in the sense that we could just be light on our feet um, and make some decisions on the fly. Um, and we decided virtual learning was, you know, counter to our education philosophy in a sense. So we did not sit our kindergartners and our second graders in front of hours and hours of video. Um, but we did continue our core academics. We did what we had to do to make it work. We plowed through spring break because no one could travel. And then we were done and we wrapped up. Um, I, I would say that we were weary, but we finished solid. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're glad to be back in school. We have not, we've, we haven't had to do any Zoom or virtual learning um, since, let's see, since May. So that's been a, a huge perk for us. Is yeah, I can, I can imagine it's quite a difference just in, in terms of the fact that, um, you know, the, the initial structure you had had parents in mm -hmm. a, an active role that they would continue, whereas so many other um, sort of traditional school structures uh, you had to bring on those parents into those roles. And I know that personally, yeah. Allison, so yeah. <laughs> I, I can attest to that. Antonio, I wanted to ask you, because you've been involved in the philanthropic space in this, uh, in, in educational innovation and in hybrid homeschooling, and have helped make some public funding available in, in Colorado for homeschool and private school families um, and students. Can you talk a little bit about your efforts and maybe some of the broader takeaways uh, on what you think philanthropy can do to support these kind of hybrid homeschools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Nat. I think that's an excellent one. And, and thanks to AEI for having me here. And it's nice to see Mike McShane and the, and the fellow panelists. I actually got to see Mike in March of last year, right before things really closed down in his hometown of Kansas City to talk about this in, in his book. <clears throat> so I think from a philanthropic perspective, I'll, I'll put some high level thoughts out there for folks. Who's, one is, we need policies in place that may allow for, from an equity standpoint, to Professor Mon's 
point, um, from an equity standpoint, that may infuse some public money. So families who would like this option but could not afford it otherwise um, can, you know, leveraging some type of public money. And that could look like dollars directly from general funds, that could look like scholarships, that could look like ESAs, that could look like uh, tax credit funded programs, um, it depends. Um, and so I think that, you know, from a policy perspective, what do states need? And philanthropy can fund policy. I, I think that philanthropy is very nervous about advocacy, which is understandable, there's, there's rules around lobbying, but as regards to, you know, creating policy, educating people, um, funding organizations which are supporting policy, which may allow for more hybrid homeschool models or micro schools and so forth, I think is one option for philanthropy. Another one is to keep in mind that like we're looking at redefining and regrouping of distribution points for education and learning. Um, and they can get smaller. And as they get smaller, you're not going to fund them the same way you would fund a new school. Right? These are very tiny. Uh, you know, if you are a large foundation, a $400,000 grant isn't the, isn't the thing that maybe a small family co-op is looking for, right? Um, however, you may want to fund the things that can help um, enhance this, that can help increase um, access to it, um, that can help adoption, uh, that can support capacity. So I think about this as like, could you fund those who inspire others to do this? Can you fund um, op options, programs, efforts, communications, campaigns, toolkits that help adoption? Um, and can you fund things that can, can help with uh, capacity building? So maybe um, Allison's team may be somebody who could go out and consult with others to help other families right, develop these. Mm -hmm. That could be something a funder could fund. It could really help with scale and impact. Um, and then the last thing that I would think about is because these are new distribution points, you may have new providers pushing learning and education into them and so funding them. So we see an increase, especially in COVID, of kind of like virtual programs that are piping their learning both into a school, but could directly pipe it into homes and anything in between. Um, and I'll give a, a, a specific example and a shout out to uh, Kaya Henderson, the former chancellor of, uh, of BC Public Schools, has launched Reconstruction. Reconstruction is a tutoring program, one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring program for any student um, that is all about the history of Black Americans, the contributions they've made. It's a, uh, it is ability to tutor on Black liberation and Black theology, Black liberation theology. And like that is, that is something you could fund that could go to a number of families. So if you're a funder, right, you're thinking about the ecosystem they exist in, the policies that could make this better, the way that you might increase adoption, and then how you may fund um, an increased number of providers that are pushing, right, data, or sorry, that is pushing learning and academics into these new distribution points. Because again, these are much smaller um, and from an investment and scale standpoint, it may not make sense to invest in hundreds of tiny uh, hybrid schools or micro schools or hybrid homeschools, but it's these components in the ecosystem which may increase its adoption as yeah, well that, as many that, other options though. Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I wanna uh, break it out into uh, a, an open discussion. Mike, I wanna just quick, kick off with a question, of course, about COVID. Now, I know, I know a lot of our listeners are going to sort of say, well, hybrid homeschooling sounds like what I've been doing for the past seven months, right? And, and that's not right. But my question is, how is it or how do what schools have been doing this year in response to COVID in a lot of places compare to the schools that you have studied? Where's that a fair comparison? And, and where's there uh, a, a whole lot of daylight between uh, those two experiences? The big difference is that the schools that I profile in the book were built this way for them from the ground up. So from day one, they were designed to operate in this way. It wasn't that they operated in one way and then over the course of a weekend had to do something different, right? So what I think is that um, so much of what we call hybrid homeschooling right now is kind of being done against people's will, right? It's like, well, what is the most time I can get? Or this is what we have to do. I mean, it's not that people necessarily jumped out to say that at, at the beginning. The schools that I profile, the teachers teach at that school because it's a hybrid homeschool. The families go there because it's a hybrid homeschool. So everyone's in there. So while what's going on in traditional schools looks like it, it's being like it's being done on the fly and it's being done as a kind of last resort as opposed to saying no we actually built this from the ground up to to function this way i'm trying to think of like an analogy of like i don't know putting together a sports team I'm, you know my bracket is completely fallen apart but it's sort of like 
putting together a basketball program and then having a team or like putting together a group of people that you kind of pulled off the street and said, go play hoops, right? It's like, it's different from building it from the ground up and having to do it on the fly. So Allison, you're uh, in this uh, business, but you're one unit, right? It's, it's not like necessarily a networked or connected business. So I'm curious, I mean, to what degree are these institutions connected even through an association or other informal networks um, I mean, how much reach do you have into other um, families and centers that are doing work like you're doing? So um, the CCCA is a registered member of the Association of Classical Christian Schools, which has hundreds and hundreds of schools across the country. Um, now, most of them are not hybrid, but an increasing number of them are. Um, so that's been great. We even named ourselves conservatory because that was the association's term for hybrid schools. Um, and it's hard right now because hybrid has a very fluid definition right now. Um, and so we're slowly starting to move towards the term collaborative um, because hybrid a lot of times means tech heavy, um, distance learning, intentionally virtual. Um, you know, Wilson Hill is this online um, classical school um, institute and they're all virtual and they call some of their things hybrid. So it's sort of, okay, we are collaborating with parents. Um, the association has been excellent for us. They've sent us all of the tools that we've needed to get off the ground. Um, they place us in cohorts, there's online forums. I feel really well supported by that association. And we even you know, meet regionally and then there's conferences every summer. So um, I, I don't feel like an anomaly. I do in town here, for sure. Um, and it's hard here. But I think of, you know, friends that I have in North Carolina, or there's like a million of them in Texas, where they just have like sprawling space and affordable real estate. And um, it just seems to be a more hospitable area to do that. It's tricky here. Um, but it's a pretty well connected association. So that has been really helpful for me. Yeah, and Allison, there's a million of everything in Texas, just so you know. But um, <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike, to follow up, when you were doing research for your book, I just wonder, what's the network look like? I mean, did you have to do a lot of work to try and get uh, a, a grasp on where the different nooks and crannies of this landscape were? Or did you find that it's sort of a known quantity? No, I found it actually very challenging because most of the schools... Um, don't identify as hybrid homeschools. It's just like the, you know, the McShane Academy of Excellence or something. And you actually have to go multiple ways down their website to like more about us and then schedule and then you pull it up. So I found out about so many of these just via word of mouth that I knew someone, um, again, I think Allison, I was connected to Allison by someone and then Allison connected to me to someone. And it was this big kind of chain of people who connected me. Um, there are a couple of these networks, like the UMSI, University Model Schools International. That's a, a network of private hybrid homeschools. Um, there are out uh, where Antonio is out in Colorado, um, where there's a really strong um, public charter and actually traditional public school districts that work with this. The Colorado, Depar Colorado Department of Education actually does a really good job of collecting them. And there's a page on their website that has all of them. But those are the exception. Those aren't the rule. Um, it's actually quite difficult to, to track down. And I'm constantly finding new ones, even where I live in Kansas City. I, was, uh, I actually happened to find out that there was one like 15 minutes from my house and didn't realize that until very recently. I was like, oh, I wonder what that school is. I should, I should, I should look at their website. And I look, I'm like, it's a hybrid homeschool. I'm like, it was next to me the whole time. So yeah, they're, they're everywhere. And it's tough to, it's tough to get your arms around exactly how many and where and how. Well, Kathleen, I'm interested in your take on this because um, it could be easy to just shift to stereotypes, whatever you have accessible to say, oh yeah, I know what hybrid homeschool is like. But as you were saying in your opening remarks, uh, black and brown communities have their own uh, sort of historical engagement in these types of institutions. Um, from that perspective, I mean, how does, uh, how familiar is this? And um, uh, in, in black and brown communities, is this uh, sort of a, a, a normal um, experience and widespread? 
a very good question. And thank you for the question, because as I was listening to, to Mike and even uh, Allison's comments regarding how uh, the birth of her her hybrid homeschool came about when she said that, you know, we hired a teacher, we pulled families together and boom, there we have it. Well, the fact is, I, you know, within African-American communities, it hasn't been as controlled as that. And I think that one of the things that we failed to discuss is that hybrid homeschools have not been based on the research in, in both Warren's book and as well as McShane, is not as organic as we hope that homeschooling should be from, from the lens that, that I see. But in the African-American community, let me just take a step back. And I think this is value added to the notes that Antonio mentioned regarding philanthropy and investing in hybrid in, in education in general, parent choice uh, more specifically, and, and hybrid, hybrid homeschooling. I think that we just failed to forget that in African-American communities, if you think about the birth of HBCUs, those institutions, for example, Spelman College, it was founded in 1881, really started as an early learning institution where we had certified teachers getting together with families, educating children. Um, and, and again, there's a host of terms and concepts and I can share the literature with your, your listening audience from Sunday schools to even, uh, for example, I'm in a, an organization that's founded in 1913 and we're very actively involved with having formally educated educators involved in teaching kids in our community. So I think that that's important that we understand that this is really, I think in my, based on the research and, and the, the findings is that hybrid homeschooling has just morphed, right? It's got a new, a new term that of something that has existed from day, day, day schools to what we call independent black institutions that have existed even as notion as far back as the 1800s when in the African-American community, we had pit schools, PIT, where slaves would often find these clandestine ways to help to teach their children. And so I think another thing that's important to know, you know, Antonio talked about this increase in adoption, that while it's hard to fund families directly, we can fund uh, these higher uh, kind of widespread efforts so I, again, I, I'll plug in for the historically black colleges and the role that they play in preparing teachers to teach. I think it would behoove us to start looking at ways in which we can ensure that we have a better qualified uh, pool of talent, right? Because it's about human capital. Even if you want to start a hybrid homeschool in an African-American community, we need to find the, the, the capital, the resources, the talent to be able to partner families and communities. And I think that it would behoove us to do that. And one final note, um, to your point, um, Mike Machine, you said, you know, I, I'll make a prediction. I think that in, in very short order, hybrid homeschools are going to morph into the conversations that are uh, having now around learning pods because there's money there. And I think that we can't just say hybrid homeschool. This is not just about education. This is about economics and certainly about question of equity. Antonio, I want to ask you about that in, in, in particular. I invite everybody to weigh in as well. But Antonio, I'll first kick it to you. I mean, you talked about how well, it may not be easy to fund, uh, you know, a, a thousand tiny gardens, but the components are one forefront where you could put funding and put efforts. Um, a lot of times we hear efforts on school choice, and some of those may be aligned to this and others may not be. Can you talk for a few minutes, uh, maybe about your work in Colorado, but just generally about what kind of policy efforts might uh, put a little bit more muscle behind folks that want to pursue this and where those efforts just aren't really aligned towards starting or participating in hybrid homeschools. Here in Colorado, and, and I'll be really specific because I think this is kind of of interest to folks. And, and, and let me back up with, you know, we think a lot about those of us who care a lot about education choice. How do you get resources in the hands of families so they can make those choices if they do not have those resources to begin with on their own? Um, and so, you know, that can look like education savings accounts, it can look like vouchers and so forth, right? Uh, I think the Gardner Scholarship um, down in Florida, right, the opportunity to, if your student is behind grade level in reading, can use some money to hire a tutor, for instance, right? Um, I think is, a, is, an interesting, is an interesting model of this. In Colorado, part of the way we thought about how to make dollars accessible for this was looking at, um, was looking at state statute as it currently is, is written. And I think that was something, and also just to go back to like, what could funders do? Um, there's a lot of fertile ground already in state statute that may allow for this access to public dollars. And let me also just caveat this with, some families may not want access to public dollars because there are things that come with public dollars and that's totally fine. So by no means am I explaining what I believe all of these should be. 
But for families that would really like that, right, and they need the resources, they'd like this option, but they need the resources to make it happen, we think about how we infuse public dollars. And in Colorado, it was looking at statute that already existed. And uh, I think um, um, Professor Mons made this comment at the beginning is, you know, this has been going on for a while and districts have taken advantage of this. I know Mike made a comment of this for a long time. And in Colorado, my guess would be for decades now, um, we've had a, a statute around part time for people. So if you're a student who's not a full-time um, public school student in Colorado, you may be receiving 100% at home, or maybe you're a private school student, you're still actually eligible to receive up to half of your public kind of education. And really, let's just say that a little differently. What I mean is whoever is supporting that child in their public education is eligible for half of the state's public per pupil revenue dollars. So what that could look like is I'm homeschooling my ninth grade student. We've hit ninth grade geometry. I use this often because I can't remember ninth grade geometry and I struggled in trig and as a junior in high school. Um, and I realized like I'm not going to be very successful right, at, at, at teaching geometry for my student. And in math, my student does really well in groups with other people. Right? And I could um, try to find a tutor. Maybe I could find some other parents who wanted to come together to hire a tutor. Maybe we can find a, t a substitute teacher. Also, what if I just here in Colorado walk down the street to my local public school and ask them, do you have a seat available in the upcoming semester for my ninth grade student for geometry? Um, is that something we can do? And in Colorado, for again, for decades, districts could say, yeah, absolutely. We'll add a seat to that math class. We'll enroll your kid as a part-time student and we'll receive at this year, it'd be almost $4,000 from the state. And if you can imagine, it does not cost $4,000 to add that seat to that classroom. So it's historically a moneymaker for districts. The question we had, and that was to, to Mike's point though, the location was in a school. People were coming to the public school. The question that we asked here was, can that money become portable? So can a district or a state authorized charter school take that part-time per pupil and deploy it outside of their walls to contract out the services that these families want and or need, or maybe even brought them? And the answer is Colorado, yes, you can. So when you merge the district and state authorized charter schools authorities and ability to contract out services with the state's part-time per pupil rules, you get into really innovative opportunity. Uh, and one of these looked like a group of 20 low income Latino families in Southern Colorado opted out of a district they were part of. They started to homeschool a few of them on their own. They found each other, of course, as the story goes, they started to grow their interests. Um, they became what would be a cooperative. And by the time I saw it, I would say it probably even ebbed into a micro school where parents were um, sharing, if not maybe sometimes having slightly less control over the academics and this cooperative or school that they had created was. Um, they only needed part-time funding to cover that because a portion of the learning happened at home. And these were families who didn't have the resources to do this on their own. There weren't charter school choices available. So we did a little matchmaking. We found a state authorized charter school that had a very similar vision and mission and model to the way these folks were running their micro school in Southern Colorado. And they enrolled those 20 students at their charter school as part-time. They covered their administrative and operational costs with a small fee. And then they contracted out a nonprofit that that homeschool cooperative was located inside of to provide those kids with part-time services. And that infused some $3,600 per student into this program that had been 100% voluntary. And so that was a different way to make available money uh, for families to create options that could look like a hybrid homeschool, that could look like a micro school, that could look like a cooperative. By the way, you could leverage this to pay for one-on-one -on -one homeschool, homeschooling. So here in Colorado, we have a, a company by the name of My Tech High out of Utah that partners with a number of districts and charter schools here in the state to provide homeschoolers with individual experiences, also leveraging that part-time per pupil. Um, and so this makes things available for folks. Um, it opens it up, it makes it more accessible. And I think we have a hard time sometimes in the ed choice kind of world, we get stuck. And like, if it's not an education savings account, if it's not a voucher, what's possible? Well, one, Allison has proven and she knows this, and this is true, Kathleen, I think, and, and I from our own backgrounds, probably with our own families of history, if a, a lower income family or a family of color or a rural family or an indigenous family wants something bad enough, they'll make it happen. They always have. Uh, Allison knows her families are making this happen right now. Um, but there is opportunity for people to think innovatively about what already exists and how we can leverage it and take advantage of it so that we can fund some of these programs to make it more accessible and equitable for everybody. So that raises a really, that's a perfect segue into something that I wanted to bring up before we go to the Q&A. And uh, Mike, I'm gonna pitch this to you. 
That's this new census pulse survey that came out with some pretty much mind blowing numbers. So if you're in the homeschool community, you've probably heard about this. Basically, they said the first week that they did this uh, back in April. So this is post pandemic. Um, last May, they had about 5.4% of U.S. households saying uh, with children, with school age children reported that they were homeschooling. And um, I, I believe that uh, that doubled just substantially among black families. It went from 3.3 to 16%. Now, you know, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. So I kind of expect that to regress to the mean, you know, when there's not a pandemic, uh, there, there's a big difference maker. But at the same time, on the heels of what Antonio was saying, that is, when people want this, they may make it happen. And on the heels of your ed choice reporting, that there's a huge percentage of people that may want to do some in school and some out, you know, let's read the tea leaves, Mike. What do you expect looking forward as far as the popularity of these institutions? And what does that mean for school districts that are afraid of losing a bunch of kids? Well, I'll tell you, when you break down some of those cross tabs, so in our polling, but obviously the in, in what was actually what the Pulse survey got there was breaking down the cross tabs, um, racial identification, but also location, right? And from our polling data, when you break down the types of people, we've been asking this question since the beginning of the pandemic, every month since the beginning of the pandemic, you know, as a result of COVID-19, how has that changed your opinion towards homeschooling? Now, again, not what they're doing that, all the necessary caveats for a stats guy like you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we found is the groups of folks that have said that they are, you know, more interested in, in homeschooling, more open to homeschooling, interestingly, more likely to be liberal than conservative, more likely to be African-American or Hispanic than white. Um, what we saw, I found fascinating in that poll survey stuff, you know, look at a state like Massachusetts, where I think they said before in their first iteration of it, they had 1% of people homeschooling and now it's 12. Um, now there were other places where it's crazy. I think Alaska is up to like 27% or something, 30%. I mean, that's, that's right. right. We might see some mean regression come down, but it's that pattern all over the place where you're seeing some, some states up in the teens and 20s. And again, some of the states that, that maybe in their number now are smaller, you ask, wait, where were they? Um, and see that growth from basically no one to one in 10 kids. Um, so again, like I, I'm with you. I think some of that might, um, some of that might regress, but do I think we're going to go back to, you know, if the base, if the true baseline number is 5%, do I think we're going to go back to 5%? I don't, you know, it may not stay 11%, but I don't think it's going to be 5%. So I, I, I promised, and I'm loath to stop asking my questions, but I, I promise. So I'm going to go to the public questions. But Allison, you've been on the ground doing this work. And so when we talk about uh, the growth in it and also uh, sort of the attitudes of uh, sort of, you know, the local public schools, my question um, for you is um, how have folks uh, in your area and, and uh, officials been over the, the course of, of your journey? Have they been supportive, sort of a mixed, um, ignored you? Uh, how would you characterize that relationship? Briefly, so I can get to their questions. Briefly, um, we actually explored, I'm a graduate of a public school. My parents went to public school. I'm a generational public school graduate. Um, and we looked at public schools here when my firstborn was gonna go in and they would not offer him special services that he needed if we were going to hold him back a year, which is what we wanted to do. So then we felt we had to find an alternative. And we started exploring um, all sorts of schools. Long story short, we are in a school district that is at 178% capacity. So they are very excited to see people get off the books and create alternatives. And so they have been wonderful to us. Um, the mayor himself helped us secure our building permit um, when we needed to build. And so I think generally speaking, they're thrilled to have another option um, to provide kids. Um, I have four kids and now we get to pay taxes here and they don't have to service my kids. So they have been so far so good. I know that's not the case for everyone. I know Maryland, their homeschooling laws are much more um, suffocating. I think Virginia is very kind to homeschoolers. Um, 
pretty much let us do what we need to do to make it happen. So, so far, praise the Lord, it's been okay. Yeah. Well, fantastic. So I want to turn to some, uh, to some questions that we've gotten from our audience. And uh, man, this is a hot potato. So you guys have better better be current if you're going to be ready to this one, because I can't even come close to commenting on it. It says Senator Sherrod Brown, Chris Van Hollen, and Kristen Gillibrand recently put forth the Full Service Community School Expansion Act of 2020. Can hybrid homeschools exist within that space, or would hybrid homeschools be separate entities? Mike, can I put you on the spot? Can you speak to that one? And if, if the answer is no, that's fine. I was going to say, you can't put me on the spot. And no, I have to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what that is or how it intersects with hybrid homeschooling. My apologies to the person who sent in that. So, a, a, Forbes, a Forbes column will be forthcoming, though, I can assure you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Kathleen, you were going to say something. No, what I was going to say is while I cannot speak to the Full Service Community School Expansion Act of 2020, I can share with you just yesterday in Georgia, the House Education Committee uh, heard what is called the Learning Pop Protection Act. And if you read it, it sounds very much like a hybrid homeschool setting such that place, to your point, Mike McShane, you talked about location, funding, and control. Um, and those are all uh, embedded in, in the description of that. Uh, but needless to say, there was another question on the floor regarding what's happening in uh, Georgia. And I think that in the work of Do uh, Dr. Warren, he talks quite a bit about hybrid homeschooling, getting some access to funding dollars, particularly as they prepare their kids for higher education. And, and I'm, I'm quoting from his work that several hybrid homeschools in Georgia are really accredited by HOPE approved accreditors. And so while these are not conventional schools, they do have access to funding to be able to go forth and uh, have legitimize, if you will, um, the, the credentialing of their children. So great question. Not sure I know exactly about that bill that's on the floor, uh, but I do think it's important that we, um, Allison, you made a point regarding your credentialing and your experience as a trained educator. Sadly enough, I homeschooled four kids, 20 years, all uh, three went to college full ride. If I wanted to become a certified teacher to engage in a hybrid homeschool setting, unfortunately, I probably wouldn't qualify based on the, the regulations that are set forth right now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I have a, I have a couple of questions here. Um, one is, um, about non-religious hybrid organizations, which, you know, the question in and of itself sort of says, well, hold on a second. These seem to be religious type institutions. So um, not, I, I wanna ask you to speak to that, but just generally speaking, can you poke some holes in some of the things that some of our audience might be assuming about hybrid homeschools? Uh, they're, they're white, they're conservative. They're, uh, you know, I, I usually think of, of homeschooling generally as either quite religiously conservative or extremely sort of granola left, right? I sort of see these two microcosms. So the same kind of question, um, what, are, what are some things, first please, if you can comment on the religious, non-religious aspect, but also just um, what are some of the stereotypes that uh, we should probably discount? And I'll, that's, a, that's a jump ball. Mike? Yeah, I mean I can say very briefly, yeah. So in the book, I profile traditional public school districts, public charter schools, and private schools. Um, and I think within the private schools, uh, religious and non-religious, a whole um, kaleidoscope of different uh, religious denominations that are in there. Um, so yes, that that's all sort of different. Now I will say, um, and this is uh, Professor Mons mentioned um, Eric Warren's uh, work. He's done very good um, surveying of hybrid homeschoolers, both in the private sector and, and in the traditional charter sector. Um, and I don't want to butcher his, his research, but it tends to be, at least in, in his initial stuff, that the um, hybrid homeschoolers that are in charter schools, and I this all of this sort of makes sense. If you get more public support of it, those people tend to be of lower income. You know, it opens it up to more diverse folks if they don't have to bear the full freight of themselves. And to be honest, that really kind of aligns with my experience in interviewing with folks in places where there was public support for these lower income people were able to take advantage of it. It's more difficult in places where parents have to have to pay the, the full freight for it. 
So, so that's the, the answer of that nap is sort of, it is contingent on the policy environment. It's contingent upon the, the amount of support that's given for families, the types of families that are able to participate. Right, but to put yeah. a, uh, just a clear point on this and to make sure that those uh, uh, of us who aren't that familiar aren't missing the boat, there's stuff to pay for here. I mean, kids are going to a school. There is an institution that must be funded. And that's completely separate from the homeschool where you, you do it inside, you fund it inside and you administrate, administer it inside. So there, someone has to pay the piper here, right? You know, Matt, no one is taught on um, today's conversation. I think it's important to talk about who pays the piper, right? So as a homeschool parent myself, we pay doubly. And, and probably as, as many of the hybrid homeschooler families will. So we paid obviously through our property taxes that went to a public school system, a district that our kids never stepped foot in. And so then and coupled with that, we'd have to buy the curriculum and that kind of thing. And certainly um, I would venture to say that the families who are hybrid homeschooling would in turn have to use those resources to hire a teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mike, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, go ahead, Antonio. No, no, I, I would just share to, to the to this very specific question. I have not heard of associate. I have not heard of many associations in this space, right? Because this is something that is um, so decentralized, diffused, and it looks to Allison's point earlier so different in so many ways. I don't think people always know how to find each other. That they might find each other under a homeschool association, right, or a private school association. I will share. There's a group called 100 Roads. Um, that is Cass Frage, who had started a uh, kind of collaborative workforce education space up in Connecticut. And she is taking this co-learning idea um, and helping communities around the country expand that and create their own co-learning kind of spaces where both like families and, and students are coming together to work, to learn, right, to educate, uh, to be in community together. And it is, it is secular. So she could support somebody who may want to infuse right, their morals or ethics, be them religious or, or otherwise. Um, and so that, that was something I'll say. And then to the point, Nat, that you were making is, if you are choosing to leverage public dollars, right, to pay for some of this, to infuse public dollars, whatever it is that you're spending your public dollars on has to be secular. And so we do have homeschool cooperatives, I'm sure, in Colorado, right, that are um, a classical Christian, you know, homes like a, a shared space, you know, or indoor at home, but they're happy to come together and do their math class, right? Or their, or, you know, a Spanish class funded, let's say by public dollars, um, because, you know, that's it being secular is okay because they have their opportunities um, to share and educate their children about their history, their community, their values, their beliefs in, in other spaces. So, and, oh, and I'll share the last thing is this micro-ish kind of homeschool cooperative that I mentioned in Southern Colorado. Um, it's called the Justice and Heritage Academy. It's in Antonito, Colorado, um, and it's secular. And actually at the heart of their work is social, environmental, and food justice. Those were things they never received um, at their district and they really wanted because they are part of a community that was in Southern Colorado before it was the United States. Um, and so there were a lot of very important things culturally to them they wanted embedded, including some, some justice pieces. So that's a secular model as an example, but to the specific question, I haven't seen many associations around that. Mm -hmm. Mike, I've got a quick question that I'm going to just pitch to you, um, and it's a yes or no question, but I want you to do the, the answer and then some. Is hybrid homeschooling only possible for wealthy families? You already mentioned the policy environment matters, but, you know, sort of what's the simple take on that? Is it at least easier? Um, it's I mean, it's easier than sending your kid to full-time private school. Um, I think for so many families, you know, the tuition at the private schools that we're looking at, the tuition is a fraction of private schools that are around there. Um, and I think is actually something that would be for many, many families would be quite manageable. And then again, there's this happening in the public sector as well that is free for the user, that you have children that don't have to pay at all. So the, the broad answer to the question is no, but I think even specifically looking across some of these sectors, it is a much more accessible option. And, and the, the school leaders that I talk to overwhelmingly talk about how um, many of the families that participate, particularly in the private schools, are ones that were priced out of traditional private schools, that they wanted, whether it was a classical environment or a Montessori environment or a Waldorf school or any of those, but those are 20 grand a year. This can be done for a third of that or even, even less and get the, the, those key kind of pedagogical things that they were. 
So um, we we have one minute left. So I'm just going to briefly, uh, Allison, Antonio, Catalina, thank you very much for coming on. This this has uh, really been a great, well-rounded conversation. Mike, um, I, I want you to give you give you one more chance to show the cover of that book before we leave, and also want to say, as you know, as as uh, the author of Hybrid Homeschooling, and this has been a tumultuous year. What would you advise the audience to kind of uh, look out for to see, um, you know, what this um, conflagration of events and, uh, you know, the, the, the new stats that come out showing on how popular homeschooling is and popular opinion suggesting there's a lot of tailwinds for these things. Um, you know, where should we look to see, um, you know, what this looks like two, three years down the line? I mean, I'm definitely going to be tracking the enrollment numbers, right? I'm going to see those full counts when they come in of how many students are actually in traditional public schools and where, where they are and in states that do things like have good data on private school enrollment and others. So that's something I'm going to be watching. And then frankly, I think um, because of the work of some forward thinking philanthropists and others, I hope and I think that more of these networks are going to come together. There are going to be more places where people can come together and share these. And I'm super excited to watch those and see because there's stuff happening right now that like we have no idea what it is. And then in a couple months, like because it'll be through these networks, we'll see and it'll blow us all away and it'll be super exciting. And I think, yeah, something that we can all learn from and be positive about. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks for your book, uh, Hybrid Homeschooling. Go out and pick it up uh, uh, online uh, at, at wherever books are sold. Um, and I, again, Mike, thanks for the book. Thanks for coming on. And Kathleen Edward Mons, Allison Morgan, and Antonio Paris, thank you all for your time. Um, that's a wrap for our conversation today. And thank you for coming to this AEI webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.